Well, brethren, as we begin this session together, let's once more seek the face of God for his promised help in our endeavors. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your very simple and wonderful word of promise given to us, your people, a promise as with all of your promises sealed and held out to us in the blood of the everlasting covenant that if we ask, we shall receive, if we seek, we shall find, and if we knock, it shall be opened unto us. And so we come asking, seeking, knocking, pleading that once again we may know the presence and help of your Holy Spirit as we would take your word into our hands and seek to understand its truth with our minds and to be governed by it in our wills and in our actions. O oh Lord, help us. We remind ourselves afresh that apart from you, we can do nothing. And yet with the apostle, we dare to say, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Grant us then the promised help as together we plead for this provision to your praise and to our good. Amen. 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 Well, brethren, we return to wrestle with this vital theme of the call of the man of God to the pastoral office. And after our broad introduction to the whole course of study, looking at our foundational principles, and then the fundamental errors regarding what constitutes a call to the pastoral office, and some of those unbiblical and unrighteous reasons for which men pursue or assume they ought to be in the office, we come in this hour to consider those things which comprise a biblical and an orderly call to the pastoral office and ministry. And my present understanding of the Word of God leads me to assert that there are four things which comprise this biblical and orderly call. Reducing them to a minimum of words, they are desire, fitness, confirmation, and recognition. Desire, fitness, confirmation, and recognition. And as you can see in your outline, I want to say a few words by way of introductory clarification and qualification. First of all, I must underscore the fact that I will attempt to set forth the biblical norm for an orderly call to the pastoral office. Psalm 119, 105 tells us, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my pathway. God's will revealed in Scripture is to be the rule of our thinking and our actions and our counsel to others. What constitutes a legitimate and orderly call to the pastoral office? Isaiah 8:20, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there is no light or no dawn for them. However, we know from this very word of God, the scriptures, and from human experience, that God in his sovereignty can and does work in ways that do not follow the norms prescribed in his word. And we've got to understand that what God may do is his business, what we ought to do is our business with our minds tethered to our Bibles. Our Bibles tell us of a disobedient prophet who in the course of his disobedience becomes an instrument in the hand of God for the conversion of a whole boatload of pagan sailors. And furthermore, in his disobedience becomes one of the most prominent types of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wonderful fruits from a disobedient man. But we do not make Jonah's disobedience and God's overruling that disobedience to bring holy fruits the norm for our lives. Disobey God and wonderful fruits will come. Likewise, the text considered in the previous hour, God will use the preaching 
of men who will go to hell in order to bring others to heaven. So what God may choose to do in the exercise of his unfettered sovereignty is one thing. What you and I are bound to do as professed followers of our God is quite another. Therefore, at the outset, you must understand that I am not denying that God can sovereignly overrule abnormalities, irregularities, and gross deficiencies when leading men into the pastoral office. Some of us sitting here came by a very crooked path. And when we hear the things we're going to hear, I do not want us unnecessarily to question whether we ought to be where we are. Now, some of you maybe ought to question whether you ought to be where you are. In other cases, you may have to go back and make up certain inadequacies. Because of the way I was brought into the ministry, I was prepared after being in the ministry for a number of years to have my calling and my fitness reassessed as my light and understanding came into line with Scripture. I persuaded a group of people that they ought to take their place in helping me to have a more orderly call to the ministry. So that qualification needs to be stated very clearly at the outset. And then this final clarification is this. As we take up this crucial issue, these four categories that I believe do constitute a biblical and orderly call may emerge in diverse ways and in a differing sequence. Just as the ways of the Spirit in imparting new birth are like the wind, they are mysterious, so in this matter of a biblical call to the ministry. We cannot deny that some are given an incipient desire for that office long before they are brought into a state of grace. And after they are brought into a state of grace and Christian character is formed and gift and grace are recognized by the people of God, they will testify under oath that as a child they had some premonition, some inclination, some aspiration for that office. And we don't deny and say you're lying, you're deluded, you're under the influence of an evil spirit. So while preaching, we've got to have one, two, three, four. We've got to lay out truth in sequence. We can't think in uh, mixed up mush. We've got to think in blocks of thought laid out sequentially. But in so doing, I don't want anyone to gather from that that I am saying that everything must come in this order in every man whom God brings into the office of a teaching and ruling elder in his church. With these clarifications and qualifications behind us, let us now begin to demonstrate from the Word of God these four things that constitute the four elements that comprise a biblical and well-ordered call to the pastoral office. And the first is what I've chosen to identify as an enlightened and sanctified desire for the work of the pastoral office. An enlightened and sanctified desire for the work of the pastoral office. Now, what do I mean by enlightened and sanctified? As I said in the earlier lecture, words capture thoughts, and thoughts frame our actions. And so it's critical that you understand what I mean by the choice of these two words, enlightened and sanctified desire. I'm using the word enlightened to underscore the fact that in a valid call, the desire does not flow out of ignorance, error, superstition, or romantic notions. Rather, an enlightened desire for the work is one that has been born of a biblical and realistic understanding of the nature and the demands of the work of the pastoral office. It is the unenlightened desire which Dabney attacks with a kind of withering sarcasm when he writes on page 33 in volume 2 of his discussions the following words. And I'm going to try to say it like I hope Dabney would have preached it. 
Away with the notion that the young man is not called to preach unless he has fallen in love with this special work in some senseless and unaccountable manner as though pierced with the invisible arrow of some spiritual heiress or Cupid. It is nonsense. It is wickedness. The Holy Spirit is a rational being. The Bible is a rational book. And every Christian emotion which he produces in the human soul by applying Bible truth is produced according to the laws of human understanding. It is a reasonable emotion prompted by reasonable and intelligent views of truth. That's Dabney with a Yankee accent. It's this very issue, not an unenlightened, ignorant, superstitious, romantic desire and aspiration, but enlightened by the Word of God and sanctified. And I'm using this word to describe a desire that emerges under the purifying influence of the Holy Spirit in direct contrast to a desire that emerges under the impulses and actings of unmortified remaining sin. A sanctified desire will be found in a heart in which the Spirit of God has in great measure negated the intoxicating influence of pride, of carnal ambition, of a distorted view of our own importance or the measure of our gifts. And so, qualification number one is an enlightened and sanctified desire. Now, what will mark this enlightened and sanctified desire? Well, I want to address four aspects of this desire. Number one, first of all, the necessity and legitimacy of this desire. And here we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. As you know, these faithful sayings are peculiar to the pastoral epistles. They are kind of sanctified cliches that apparently had found their way into the life and thinking and language of the people of God in the churches by the time uh, these pastoral epistles were written. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the apostle writes, Faithful is the saying, if a man seeks the office of an overseer, or if a man seeks overseership, as Fairbairn would render it, he desires a good work. Here the apostle clearly indicates that desire ordinarily precedes and attends recognition to function in the work. And this desire is to be strong and prevailing as opposed to weak and intermittent. The two words that are used, present indicatives of oregomai and epithumeo, the one meaning to be eager for and the other to lust, to desire strongly. And being used in the present tense, they underscore that the desire is not only to be present, but it is to be a sustained desire. Not a desire that occasionally and obliquely touches the heart and mind of a man, but becomes a kind of holy obsession. The ESV renders it, if anyone aspires to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble Task. So first of all, with respect to this desire and its legitimacy, it is ordinarily to proceed and attend recognition for the work. Secondly, the desire is to focus upon the work. If a man seeks the office or overseership, he desires a good work. It is the entire work of the overseer. And I come back again to where I don't feel comfortable with this idea. I'm called to preach. I desire to preach. Many a man loves the sound of his own voice who doesn't want to take the towel in the basin and wash feet. And much of true oversight is foot wash labor in the spirit 
of our Lord Jesus Christ. The desire is to focus upon the work, not on any apparent glory and prominence attached to one aspect of the work, but the work in its entirety. And thirdly, such a desire is both desirable and noble. It is a faithful, a trustworthy saying. Not a saying that we ought to be ashamed of, but it is a saying expressing something that is noble and desirable when it is found in the heart of a man. Here I quote Fairbairn, page 136 of his exposition of the pastoral epistles. The sentiment here expressed then is that one who seeks a regatai stretches forth towards longs after the pastoral office desires to be engaged in what is emphatically a good work. It's not merely a post of honor or a position of influence, not that primarily at least, or in its more direct aspect, but a work of active service and one that from its very nature brings one into living fellowship with the pure and good. The seeking here intended, therefore, after such an office must be of the proper kind, not the prompting of a carnal ambition, but the aspiration of a heart which has itself experienced the grace of God and which longs to see others coming to participate in the heavenly gift. Other objects of a subordinate or collateral kind may not be unlawful and may justly enough be allowed a certain share in the motives which draw men to the pastoral office, but if the heart is right with God and takes anything like a correct estimate of the work of the ministry, it will be that work itself considered with respect to its own excellent nature and blessed fruits that may be expected to spring from it, which ought more especially to awaken the desire and determine the choice. Hence, the prominence given in the directions that follow to qualifications of a spiritual and moral kind in order to its efficient discharge introduced by an un. Therefore, as much as to say, the work being so good, there is of necessity required in him who would enter on its functions a corresponding character of goodness. The necessity and legitimacy of this desire. Without this desire, leading into a man's assumption of the office and constantly attending him in that office, if he remains in the office, he'll do so in disobedience to the clear injunction of 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 5, we'll back up to verse 1 in our reading. The elders therefore among you I exhort, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, who am also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, tend the flock of God, literally Perform the manifold functions of a shepherd to the sheep of God, the flock of God which is among you, exercising the oversight, and then the two negatives, not of constraint but willingly, nor yet for filthy lucre, base gain, but of a ready mind. Not of constraint but willingly, of a ready mind. Other words expressing the fact that I do not regard myself as one who has been drafted or conscripted against my will, but as one who is anxiously, anxiously and joyfully volunteered for the task. What then, secondly, is the focus of this desire? We've considered the necessity and legitimacy of the desire. What's the focus of the desire? Since the desire is to be a sanctified lusting, it is to be for the good work of overseeing and shepherding the flock of God, or in the language of 1 Timothy 3, 5. It should be a desire to take care of the church of God. Now, specifically, as we think of this focus of the desire, let me set before you three subheads. 
First of all, it is a longing to be used in self-denying service to edify the people of God. A longing to be used in self-denying service to edify, build up, advance, and promote the ongoing sanctification of the people of God. Why are pastors and teachers given according to Ephesians 4, Acts 20, 1 Peter 5? Is it not for the equipping of the saints unto works of service, for the maturation of the saints till they come to the full knowledge of the Son of God, the protection of the saints? Paul charges the elders, the pastors, take heed to the flock. There are wolves from without. There are perverse men from within. Be constantly watchful. Well, then surely, if this intelligent, enlightened, sanctified desire is for the work, it will be evident that in my heart has been planted by the Spirit of God a longing to be used in self-denying service to edify the people of God. In the language of Hebrews 13, 17, a desire to watch for their souls. But then secondly, under this focus of the desire, a longing to be used in spirit-filled ministry to call out more of God's elect. A longing to be used in a spirit-filled ministry to call out more of God's elect. Remember Paul's words in 2 Timothy 2.10, Wherefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It was this passion in the apostle that caused him to write as he did in 1 Corinthians 9, Though I am free from all men, in Christ I am free from being a Jew and from the expectation of Jews that I live as a Jew. I'm free from Gentiles and any of their expectations that I live as a Gentile. I'm so free in my identity in Christ that I can voluntarily make myself the slave of all that I may gain the more. That's the disposition that must burn in the heart of a man of God, recognizing the truth of Romans 10, 17 and following, that it is through those who are sent as preachers that God is pleased primarily to call out his elect, not exclusively. But when one reads through the book of Acts, almost every recorded instance of the growth of the church through conversions is in connection not with the generic witness of the individual people of God, but the proclamation of the word by the appointed servants of God. That's a reality. Now, the life of the people of God validated the gospel as they preached it and the context in which they preached it. But with a proper emphasis upon every believer seizing every opportunity according to gifts and and all these other dynamics to speak verbally of Christ, we don't doubt that. But brethren, we cannot deny that the text of Scripture leads us to believe God chooses to call out His elect primarily through the sent ones as they proclaim the message. And therefore, if part of that office is the privilege of standing as a commissioned herald to speak forth the truth of the gospel, then surely a desire for that office should manifest itself not only in a longing to be used in self-denying service to edify the people of God, but a longing to be used in spirit-filled ministry to call out the elect of God. And here Spurgeon waxes passionate when he writes on page 32 of his lectures to his students, It is a marvel to me how men continue at ease in preaching year after year without conversions. Have they no bowels of compassion for others? No sense of responsibility upon themselves? Dare they, by a vain misrepresentation of divine sovereignty, cast the blame on their master? Or is it their belief that Paul plants, Apollos waters, and God gives no increase? Vain are their talents, their philosophy, their rhetoric, and even their orthodoxy without the signs following. How are they sent of God who bring no men to God? Prophets whose words are powerless, sowers whose seed all withers, 
Fishers who take no fish, soldiers who give no wounds, are these God's men? Surely it were better to be a mudraker or a chimney sweep than to stand in the ministry as an utterly barren tree. At least the yearning. You notice I did not say constant evidence of being used, but a longing to be used. I find it difficult when I go into Reformed churches where there's a commitment to biblical orthodoxy and expository preaching and preachers find no avenue out of the text or subject at least for three minutes to address the unconverted directly and passionately. It disturbs me. Do they really believe everyone to whom they preach is in a state of grace? Surely they don't. And if they have lost men and women and boys and girls before them and they believe that we know not what a day may bring forth and some could drop into hell before Monday, how can they go through Lord's Day after Lord's Day with no impassioned entreaty to the lost? One has to question why are they in the ministry? Did they have as part of that desire, that longing to be used in spirit-filled ministry to call out God's elect? And then thirdly, Part of the focus of this enlightened and sanctified desire is a longing to discharge a growing sense of divine given stewardship. This is for those who've not yet entered the office, a longing to discharge a growing sense of a divinely given stewardship. And here we go back to 1 Corinthians 9, 16 and 17, where the apostle reflects upon this in terms of of his own experience. Why does he deny himself, make himself slave to Jew and to Gentile that he might gain them, that he might win them? He tells us, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. Necessity is laid upon me, for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward, but if not of my own will, I have a stewardship entrusted to us. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in seeking to sort out the skewed thinking of the Corinthians about Paul and Apollos and Cephas, he said, think of us in terms of who we are. Let a man so account of us in terms of who and what we really are. We are ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And that has no reference whatsoever to the sacraments. I get upset when I find a proof text that ordained ministers are the only ones who should touch the bread and the wine and the water of baptism, and this text is used, that they and they alone are stewards of the mysteries of God. I don't believe the mysteries of God here are the sacraments. The mysteries of God in the context are the revealed truths in the gospel, those truths concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Bridges has some very, very pointed things to say on this matter in his book, The Christian Ministry, pages 94 to 98. Well, we've looked at the legitimacy of this desire, the focus of this desire. Now, thirdly, the assumed context for this desire, the assumed context of this desire. Remember the setting in which these words came to Timothy. There was an established church at Ephesus birthed through the labors of the apostle and his companions. He leaves Timothy at Ephesus some years later, some guess as long as 13 years. I'm not quite sure how they calibrate it, but I came across that in my recent reading. And he says to Timothy in this already healthy, biblically functioning church, Timothy, I want you to know how men ought to behave themselves in the house of God so that when he gives this faithful saying, it was not a saying coined by naive theorists concerning church order, church officers, who should come into the office and how. It was a church with men doing the real work of the ministry. Paul gathering the elders of the church and charging them. So the context in which this desire was to be regarded as a noble thing, in which this desire would grow in the heart of a man, it was the context of a functioning, well-ordered church. 
in which the counsel of mature people could be sought, in which there would be all of the privileges and the checks and balances of that context. And here I give a word of warning. It was a stumbling block to me looking back. Beware of biographical conditioning of your thinking of the context in which a man should be called to this work. Beware of the distorted conditioning when all the emphasis in the call to the ministry has to do with a call to preach and omits those dimensions of the great responsibilities of shepherding the flock, the responsibility of taking care of the church of God. And then we come in the fourth place to the proper channels for expressing this desire. If it is, by God's grace, an enlightened and a sanctified desire, and a man is persuaded of the necessity of that desire, the focus of that desire is increasingly this longing to be used in self-denying service to edify, to be used in spirit-filled ministry to call out God's elect, a growing sense of burden. I have a stewardship entrusted to me. I didn't seek it. I didn't ask for it. It's laid upon me. And in the context of the church, I want to know if this desire should be pursued. What are the proper channels for a man to express this desire? Well, let me suggest four of them. Number one, to God himself, first and foremost, to God himself. Many of us can remember as early and young Christians, one of the first set of verses we memorized was Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean upon your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And in that confidence, as this desire begins to be birthed in the heart of a man, encourage him to lay it out before God. Ask God to search the heart. And if the desire is being kindled by God, that God would intensify it. And then encourage men who may come to counsel with you to consider when is this desire most fervent? When is it most consciously throbbing in their hearts? It is, in, is it in their times when they are closest to the Lord? When they are most consistent in their devotional life? Most conscious of growing in grace? Encourage them to spread the thing out before God. Secondly, to one's wife if married. How can two walk together if they're not agreed? And it's my persuasion that in the light of 1 Timothy 3, that a man must rule well his own house if he is to be biblically and orderly recognized, then a man's wife must concur with him that indeed the gifts and graces are being evident in her husband because her husband's going to be her pastor or one of her shepherds. And if the thought is utterly in Congress, you, my pastor, then he better say, wait a minute, maybe this desire is premature. Bear your heart, encourage men to bear their hearts to their wives, to ask their wives very frankly, as you go through 1 Timothy chapter 3, what do you see in those musts of one aspiring to the office that you do not see in me? And dear, be as honest with me as God will be on the day of judgment. Spare me not. Now some of you might be afraid to do that even now. Because you know the things she'd point to. One of the most salutary periods in my life was a period after our children were grown and out of the house. And one of our members had a place down off the immediate shore, but down in near the Jersey Shore. And my wife and I would get away for seven to ten days once a year. And part of that time was what we called our annual judgment day, in which my wife was asked, Dear, whatever you could change in me that you believe would make me more like Christ, if you had the power, tell me. And the ground rules are, I can make no defense, no excuses. I put invisible duct tape on my mouth and just listen. And then the next day, 
she put the duct tape on her mouth. It was a very salutary thing. And by God's grace, I was able to identify some areas where I needed to grow in grace, not areas that were so crassly contrary to the word that I should have disqualified myself in the light of 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1, but certainly areas where if my wife was to sit and embrace me as her shepherd from the depths of her being, areas that I needed to work on and she needed to see me growing in grace if I were to hold her conscience in an iron grip when she sat as one of my sheep. Now, brethren, that's not an easy discipline, but I testify to the tremendous benefits of it. If this desire is of God, then surely the wife who, with whom we are one will share with us, and if she doesn't, then you have to ask the question, is it the will of God for me to pursue this matter? Can we together be an example of what the grace of God does in the marriage and family relationship? Then thirdly, of course, you want to express it to your overseers, to your pastors. Encourage men in the church who may begin to feel this desire to bear their hearts to their pastors and ask the question, have you seen the emergence of grace and the emergence, at least in some seed form of gifts that have caused you to wonder, could it be that Christ is forming me into a gift to give to his church? And encourage them to be ready to listen. If indeed these are biblically disciplined, spiritually minded men. And then, fourthly, to mature, trusted, spiritual friends and counselors to bear your heart to those who know you best and love you best and know God and know his word and love you enough to be honest with you. Encourage especially younger men to do this. And Spurgeon was quite emphatic that one of the best sources was the peers of young men in a concentrated context of preparation for the ministry. And Spurgeon went on to say that rarely did the men in the pastor's college miss in their assessment of their peers. Well, taking that counsel, when we had the academy, we used to have a season of peer evaluation. When we would meet with each man in the academy, and we'd have a tabulated thing of the list of all the other men, and have each man evaluate his brethren. And then we'd get all that material, collate it, and call each man in and say, you know what you want to look like in the eyes of your brethren? Here we go. No names mentioned, but they perceive in you positive and negative. They perceive in you some real leadership capacity. They have seen you taking initiative in this and that. On the other hand, they see in you a stubbornness. When it comes to matters that are not matters of principle, you're ready to stand your ground just because it's your ground and not to yield. And it gave us a wonderful opportunity to identify and give exhortation in areas of character that needed to be shored up as well as give commendation in areas that were commendable. So, desire. This is the first prerequisite for a biblical and orderly call to the pastoral office. I trust that what we've laid out concerning these matters is true to the Word of God and that we will find helpful as we seek to evaluate ourselves and to give counsel to others who aspire to the office of the pastorate. Well, let's pray and ask God to continue to help us as we reflect upon these matters, as we search the Scriptures and bring everything to the touchstone of the Word of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the conviction that you have given us that if it is not sufficient to help us in coming to clear thinking with respect to what constitutes a biblical and orderly call, you have left your church bereft of the data so necessary for so vital an aspect of its life. And we believe that in your goodness you have given us the scriptures and we pray that you would increase our understanding of them and our grace to be obedient to them. We commit to you the matters with which we've wrestled in this hour for your continued blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.